So, Sophie Line and Stefan, I have the director and curator here at Arsenal and Tank Museum, and we're going to show you the next section here of the collection. This is the part where we keep uh, the Second World War stuff from uh, outside of Sweden. We have a few American, German, Russian vehicles, and you can see a lot of uh, different things. All right, so we have a lot of variation. There's a lot of different vehicles. So let's get started. All right, so here's a familiar tank, and this one is a little bit different, and this one is really cool. And you don't really think, I'm going to come all the way to Sweden um, to see some kind of Sherman. But this one is really special. Show us about this one. Yeah, it's a Firefly, a British Firefly, which is uh, not that common anymore. Right. Shermans you can find anywhere, but in different uh, versions. Yeah, so it's not um, just a Sherman. This is a fairly complete Firefly that uh, Sweden bought after the Second World War as a test vehicle. And if you Google and find on YouTube, there is a lot of films with a Panther and a Sherman Firefly doing uh, test, um, different tests. And these films are this tank. Wow. Um, not if often said in the text line that is Swedish. People think it's a, some sort of evaluation from, from Germany in 1944, but no, it's from Sweden in 1950. Hmm. And what's it's more a bit unique about this tank is that this tank was used as one of the test beds when Sweden designed the S-Tank. They used the chassis and had um, another type of, of um, transmission and used the track to, to try to steer it this way as the S-Tank does. Hmm. So in the bottom part, you have uh, big holes from uh, where they had the cables and hoses uh, coming out of it. So it, um, it was part of the development of the S-Tank. That's amazing. How did Sweden it, end up with a Firefly in the first place? Um, they bought uh, four Sherman tanks uh, after the Second World War to have as a test vehicle. Uh, they bought a lot of uh, German, uh, British vehicles just to try and see what are they capable of doing? I'm not sure, perhaps uh, there was an intention of perhaps buying Sherman tanks after the war. It could be one of the, one of the reasons. Mm. Uh, but uh, I think the major reason was to, to suck out as much information as possible from what others had done at the time. Yeah, that makes sense. Very cool piece of history here. Yeah. yeah. So as a World of Tanks player, this one sticks out to me a lot. So this is one of my first favorites when I started to play the game. Um, some of the wartime weapons that you see a lot, the very effective ones, or the ones that become very distinct, it comes, comes alive in the game. And for me, the Hetzer was one of them. And this Hetzer is very special. It's very specifically special because it is a Hetzer. A lot of times the, the Hetzers that you're going to see in museums or at events are not really real Hetzers. So tell us a little bit about this one and what's important about it being a Hetzer. Yeah, as you said, it is a genuine Hetzer made during the Second World War in what was then uh, Czechoslovakia and Czech Republic today. And Sweden bought this tank or tank destroyer after the Second World War. We think it came from Denmark. We had a bunch of, of different vehicles that we uh, bought and tested, and this was one, one of them. And we also have in the collection a G13, which is the version that came later after the Second World War produced for Switzerland. But this one is a, a genuine German Hetz. And you can see the difference if you look at the front. There is no plug for checking the oil mm. at, um, inside, inside uh, the sprockets. That's one of the easiest thing to see. It's a fake Hetzer or it's a original Hetzer. Also, the gun doesn't have the muscle break at the front. Hmm. Wasn't is, it so that early Hetzer design did have a gun with the muscle break? Um, I'm not sure if all was without uh, or not. Okay. Uh, I, I cannot tell. Uh, and if you compare the Hetzer to the 38T, which is standing over there, you think they are the same chassis, hmm. but they are not. The Hetzer is wider and longer, 
And if you compare the wheel dimension from the F38T to the Hetzer, it's a bit bigger mm. and it's a bit wider. So it looks the same, but it's different. Mm. So it's a tremendously effective design. Yes, it was. It was uh, perfectly, uh, for the time, used as a tank destroyer. Yeah, for its role at its time, yeah. tremendously effective. That's it. And it becomes, it becomes a, a staple of online features for gameplay as well yeah. as a machine. But it's really cool to see one that is a real one. Yeah. Unfortunately, the color is not correct as it should be. Ah, but uh, what should it be? We're not really sure. Depends on where it was serving and when. It should be uh, the yellowish um, uh, Dunkelgelb that it was used at the end of the war. Uh, but uh, could be camouflage. Uh, we're not really sure. So we have to find out more about the information where it came from. Okay, fair enough. Well, then I guess that adventure would begin. And it's always we will, ongoing. We hope we will find something more, yes. Yeah, cool. Excellent. Something else that's unique that you can only see here. So tell me about this one. This is um, sort of a Stug. Sort if of a Stug. You, if you compare it to a, a German tank destroyer, a Swedish version that was uh, designed during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. um, Swedish designers looked outside what's happening in the world and they realized uh, the Stug kind of vehicles were quite effective. Maybe we should have something similar. And the tank at the time couldn't take a big gun right. because of a lot of difficulties. So they copied the concept of a Stug and had a fixed gun that could only traverse little sideways and up and down and made this uh, Panzerkanonwagen, it's it called in Sweden, hmm. a sort of a tank destroyer. Okay. Designed during the Second World War, but it wasn't ready until 1947. And in 1947, too late. Things that did kind of yeah, change. Yeah, changed quite a lot during Were there the things like, when you see, um, so a lot of the German sites, you mentioned the Stug or the Hetzer, sort of these casemate tank destroyer type designs. You see the SU-100 was this sort of, um, you know, it doesn't, does the gun traverse at all or is it totally fixed? No, it, it traverses. Okay, uh, just a little bit. Yeah, so yeah. You, you see the, the big uh, bulb there. So you, yeah. you can have a, maybe 10, 20 degrees. Okay. You can traverse it sideways. Was this a design that, um, in for Swedish tank designers, did they decide to do away with it and move back more to a tank with a roll with a traversing turret like we see in later on? or? Did, did they learn something from this that they could later use, or was it? did it just show up too late and never found its place? I think it showed up too late, and then they, they used it for, for <clears throat> a long time. And they also did <clears throat> development from the beginning. It didn't have any roof. It was open at the, wow. at the top. Okay. But they realized quite, quite soon, well, there is a threat from above. So they put a roof on, and because of the roof, you had the fumes inside. So they put the fume extractor later on so it it developed during its uh, lifetime gotcha. okay. in, in several uh, from the beginning it was possible to traverse the gun into the tank hmm. so you had the uh, the weight point being more to the middle ah, okay. instead of as here at the front so the wheels at the front are reinforced to be able to bear the extra weight on I the front see. wheels. What do there we have? So in in this particular one, is that something that we're going to do? Move the gun? Is that a feature on this one? No, it is, it's a fixed. It's fixed it's, now. It's okay. fixed now yes. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so that was one one of the the development they did when they put the roof on. They made the, the gun fixed, etc. Gotcha. So, okay. Yeah. And it has two engines at the rear, two Scania parallel engines. Okay which was uh, something that they took from the tank from 1942. Uh, used the same concept. Smoothed it forward. Two parallel en engines okay. and one gearbox box at the front. Gotcha. Okay, so tell me a little bit about the gun. Is the gun something that at its time would have been fitting, would have been effective? And did they, did they use this design at all later? Yeah, it was, a, it was a really good gun at the time. It was, um, um, from the beginning, it was an anti-aircraft gun. What they redeveloped and used as a tank destroyer gun, and with 
the long barrel, 70, 75 millimeter, it was quite effective at the time. And they used the same type of gun in another tank that we upgraded a bit later to become the 74 tank. Okay. It has the same type of gun. Gotcha. That's cool. So it looks like some lessons were learned. It showed yes. up too late to yes. prove its effectiveness, but lessons learned for future designs. Yeah. That's cool. Interesting. Okay. So this vehicle is another unique one. Yeah. So we have one. Is this twin anti-aircraft guns yep. on, on a mobile chassis here. So tell me a little bit about this one. It's a Swedish um, extended chassis based on what was a light tank in the 1940s. A bit longer, a bit wider. Um, with an anti-aircraft turret with two Bofors 40 millimeter guns, the famous gun from the Second World War. That's right. And the interesting part with this is that we exported to Hungary and Finland similar vehicles, but with only one gun. Hmm. And in Hungary they are called um, Nimrod, and in Finland Anti. They look pretty much the same and they were used uh, during the Second World War and uh, it, on the Russian campaign the Hungarians uh, they were used uh, on, on the invasion of, of uh, Soviet Union okay. so you can see uh, a lot of similar looking vehicles on pictures from the Second World War. Okay. Were these uh, ever, was this, was this variant ever used in the Second World War? No it was not, okay. uh, it uh, came later, it was into production after the Second World War. So gotcha. we used the knowledge from what we have sold to the other uh, countries and then we developed with twin, twin gun instead. And when it came out in 1949, it was um, a lot later than it should have been. Mm. Yeah. Was it too behind the times to ever be used again? It, so, sort of. Um, it was uh, only an intended as a trial vehicle. They made uh, 16 of them. Okay. Uh, so there were not, not, not many of them. But they were used for some time, uh, a lot of difficulties with uh, underpowered vehicle. It was too heavy, it was uh, too long, too wide. So they had to do a lot of improvement to make it work as it was supposed to be. Hmm. Uh, so it was... The, the idea is great, but the design with this chassis maybe wasn't the best solution. Mm. So they even changed the engine in it. They made the tracks wider to be able to, to cope with uh, the maneuverability. So they, they, they did a lot. If you had your pick, was there a different chassis that, at, at the time, right? At the time, which, which chassis would you have picked instead of the one that they went with? I think it would have been better to use the same chassis as the, ah. this, this one. That would have been more effective and powerful and maybe it would have been lasted a lot longer. Gotcha. But with two guns at a time, fantastic. And the accuracy of it was great. So but a crap sort of chassis. Hmm, okay, fair enough. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> 